Now, it might seem odd that human beings can calculate the degrees of genetic relatedness between themselves and, in fact, choose spouses and best friends on the basis of the more genetically inherited traits. But in fact, very, very simple organisms can do it. This capacity and, in fact, desire to, to mate with somebody simil similar to oneself occurs all the way down the phylog phylogenetic scale. Insects prefer similarity, as many species of insects do. Birds do. Other mammals do. Even plants do. For evolution to work to create social assortment based on genetic similarity many, many times over in separate independent evolutionary events means that that trait confers fitness benefits. In other words, it helps replicate genes. It would never have evolved because it's costly. It would never have evolved if it wasn't adaptive. This particular study that I put up is a study of guard bees, uh, 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 of sweat bees. So the way sweat bees operate is you have a hive. There's a small opening to the hive. There is a guard bee that stands by the hive door. It's a big bee, and it blocks the hive entrance with its body. And it looks out. And when it sees another bee coming towards the hive, it makes a decision to move its body out of the way and let the bee in or not let the bee in. And it does this over and over and over again. In this particular experiment done by Greenberg in 1979 and published in Science, an absolute classic now in this field, he experimentally bred for degrees of relatedness to the guard bee. And he found that line that you see going up there like just a straight line is essentially evidence that the closer the degree of genetic relatedness there was to the guard bee, the more likely the guard bee was to let the other bee in. For our purposes, what you need to see is that even bees, complex though they may be, they're incredibly simple organisms by comparison with humans. In terms of the nervous system and the brain, it doesn't compare uh, with even ground squirrels or the size and complexity of our brain. And yet these bees have hardwired the capacity to discriminate degrees of genetic relatedness to itself and to prefer those who are similar, to act altruistically to those who are similar. We can go to the next slide. This is a ground squirrel. This particular ground squirrel is at the moment uh, barking an alarm call. It is standing up on its hind legs, somewhere in the Nevada desert perhaps, and uh, it spotted an eagle. An eagle will come down and prey upon this ground squirrel. It's putting itself in danger. What it should really do is dive for cover. But the very fact that it's standing up on its hind legs and barking, warning all the other ground squirrels in the vicinity to take cover is an act of altruism. And the question for evolutionists, Charles Darwin posed the problem in 1870, and he said, how did evolution evolve? I mean, how did altruism evolve? It seems to go against the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution seems to be that you as an individual are selfish. Look out for yourself. If you survive, survival of the fittest, replicate your individual genes, this is the way natural selection works. The devil take the hindmost. So how does altruism, helping behavior, kindness to others, possibly evolve as an adaptation? And the simple answer, which wasn't really solved satisfactorily until about the 1960s, uh, is altruism. It is that altruism benefits genes. But you share genes. You share genes not only with your immediate family, but even with more extended family. And this ground squirrel is in fact far more likely to stand up on its hind legs, experimental evidence, when the squirrels around it, that surround it at any particular point in time, are genetic relatives. In fact, the more genetically related they are to this ground squirrel, the more likely it is to stand up. And if you go to the other extreme and put genetically unrelated individuals there, it will not stand up and give an altruistic signal. And this ground squirrel's capacity for discrimination, 
fine distinctions uh, is quite marked. In fact, ground squirrels are promiscuous, and the female will be impregnated by maybe two different males, and it will have a litter of perhaps eight little squirrels, four of whom are uh, full siblings, and fathered by one male, four of whom are essentially half-siblings to the other four, fathered by a different male. Even the siblings are able to discriminate among themselves as to who is a full sibling that is sharing 50% of their genes, I mean 50% of their genes, and who is a half-sibling sharing only 25% of their genes. Agonistic interactions are much more among the half-siblings than among the full siblings. And there are a lot of experimental studies in the animal sociobiology literature that support this. Um, we can move to the next one. Of course, when, by the time you get up to chimpanzees, a very, very social animal, uh, the capacity for uh, discrimination, social discriminations, and so on, uh, become quite remarkable. And when you come to humans, as shown in the bottom slide, uh, with Jane Goodall there gazing almost lovingly at this chimpanzee. And you will know from many of you that Jane Goodall is an animal rights activist, and some people would say she prefers animals more than she does people. We know that with humans, the capacity for altruism really can take on uh, a level of ethical altruism that is universal and beyond even the human species. So I'm not trying to suggest that this desire for your own relatives is in a, a totally animalistic, bee-like manner for humans. Uh, in fact, with humans and even chimpanzees, uh, social learning, a lot of social learning takes place, um, and uh, obviously it's the case with Jane Goodall, extended altruism well beyond the kinship group is possible. But nonetheless, the basic impulses I'm arguing uh, stem out of uh, genetic similarity and altruism.